This is ArtSense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. On today's episode, I speak with artist Matthew Day Jackson, whose show Against Nature is up now through July 1st at Pace's 510 West 25th Street location in New York. Jackson uses a host of inspirations from Romanticism to help share his unique vision for the world. The results are captivating landscapes that consist of dozens of intricate layers made with a wide variety of materials and mechanical processes. And now, a conversation about one man's view of the world with Matthew Day Jackson. Matthew Day Jackson, thank you for joining me this week on the ArtSense Podcast. Matthew, you currently have a show up at Pace called Against Nature, now through July 1st. It's kind of a new body of work that it looks like you've been working on for a couple of years. Maybe we can start where I start with a lot of artists, which is kind of a hypothetical. Let's say you, Matthew, were sitting down at a dinner party next to somebody who has absolutely no idea who you are or what your uh, work looks like. How do you start to explain to them uh, who you are and what your work consists of. Uh, I think first I would probably get over just being nervous being there in the first place. Um, and then I would probably try to talk to them about bicycles, <laughs> um, maybe go on skiing or, or some other thing. It's funny. I, I don't, you know, I, I think that like to describe what I do is that I guess I would say that I'm an artist and I'm interested in how um, history finds itself in the present um, well, simultaneously, I'm not an academic. And so it's the things that I bump into, um, that I feel that feel familiar to me. And, and then I try to describe my experience on earth and it can take a lot of different forms. Um, but in general, I think a lot of what I do is, uh, comes from printmaking and how I think in terms of layers layering of things um and all in an attempt i think to describe my experience but to never get stuck in telling you about me i'm in it but i'm not interested in 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 telling you about me i guess i guess i mean that's that's a hard one you know it's like it's funny you just described like the most stressful event that i can imagine right (laughs) To like art dinner party. Um, but I think that that would probably be a good way to describe generally what I do and what I'm interested in. So, so the work isn't necessarily a self portrait, it's like an image of your shadow or an image of your reflection, right? It, it embodies you, but it, it's, it does so rather tangentially. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, the way that I look at it is that like you can run, but you can't hide, you know, you're in there. I I'm in the work there. There's nothing I can do to extract myself from that, but I don't, you know, but like where I show myself on the surface, you know, I think that so much of the art that I, you know, grew up understanding to be art and like, what would be an achievement in making an art, you know, in making an artwork, I think, you know, has so much to do about expression. And for me, you know, like I I was a master printer. I I use that term very, very loosely, Um, but printing for other artists. And I really enjoyed um, acquiring skill and technique so that I could achieve this thing for another artist. And I think that I just went on into my professional life as an artist, just doing the same thing for myself you know, developing process, developing a way of working that, that is, that could be not automated, but, but would allow, um, materials process form or image to, to happen that they're, that, that they're, um, trying, you know, I think it's, I, I was just talking to a friend earlier in the gallery today, and I think about it, um, as being like a card magician, you know, like a close up. Mm-hmm card magician. And I think that what I'm always trying to achieve is some sort of 
magic in making the thing where you're not really being confronted with my hands. And I think that in some cases, when I when it when it's been um when I've been successful, that they're puzzling. Like you don't like that you wouldn't really know exactly how they're made. And and in that moment, then I can disappear. And um, and I feel like that's, you know, like, and that's like a, a thing that I would think is like a great achievement is when I disappear from it. But the the problem, it's like the the puzzle is that you can't, you can't run. You're just always in there. You can't hide from it. So I think for any artist, there's two big things at play and that's what you're saying and how you're saying it, right? I feel like this show, uh, your your previous show, the the windows, flowers, and thistles. You know, a couple of years ago, you know, down the street, there's a lot in play in terms of point of view, right? Like observing the world. Whose point of view does this work represent? Is it, you know, sometimes we talk about, you know, the male gaze, the female gaze. Whose eyeballs are we looking through in this work? Is that a, yeah. does that make sense? Well, that makes that, and actually, it's a great way to say it. I, and I, I'm probably going to steal that from you. <laughs> is that I think that I, absolutely my perspective, and I think that you know, I think that in every show, you know, although I'm not, I'm not wanting to tell you about me, but in terms of like flowers and thistles, you know, the the reclining figures, like what does it mean for me as like a, a young, white, straight male to then put these, you know, although they're not human bodies, but, you know, pieces of tree and bits of junk that I find into these poses, like what does it mean and how it connects to that tradition of the odalisque and the reclining figure of a bo- of creating a body to be consumed and and that is very much like in question and and i think that that you know for me you know the you know i think that you know even early on like the the first show that i had in new york called fortunate son was that there was work in that show that that felt to me you know that, that i was making something that that was you know, for all intents and purposes scary but i think reflected a world that I wanted to see and wanted to create. I wanted to celebrate things that I believed in and loved, although they fell outside of like my race or gender or even, you know, whether I was gay or straight. And, and I recognize it in those, I think that as I get older and older, that, that I'm, that we're way more plural, way more complicated um, than we could even imagine ourselves and the you know in making art and in the in like going back to that point of view that i'm able to present to myself like a material like fact of uh, of my ideas one that this is like affirming from the standpoint that yes i exist on earth and that these ideas that i have are real and that when people respond to them that they feel like they're important and that makes me feel like happy and 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 um that that has been an achievement um but at the same time the things that we wear on the outside and the things that we wear on the inside that art gives us an opportunity to sort of blend those things together make them real for the viewer but then more importantly make them real for ourselves um so i don't that was probably horrible answer to that but i really like that yes craig they're very much my perspective 100 percent. i feel like these landscapes are are taking a a lot of inspiration from that romantic period uh the search for the sublime and you know some of those like you know i think of specifically of like uh, the oxbow at face level it looks like you know, celebrating the landscape. But if you look closely, it's really looking at manifest destiny, right? Oh. And so I'm just wondering, at the surface level, these are landscapes. But when we look closely, what are we going to find? You know, is that up to us to look inside ourselves? Or is there something more there that you're really wanting us to get to? You know, it's funny, I'm, I'm really passive, I, I, I feel like I, I, when I make something, I'm so purposeful in making the thing 
that once it's shown, I, I, people can take whatever they want from it. But for me, I, I've made so many works that, that, that are, um, that go back to Albert Bierstadt and Yosemite Valley and, and what those paintings meant when they were made and then exhibited, but then also what they mean now, they still have this, this veneer of hopefulness and it has this that the, they exude a light of that something that I identify with in you know like I was raised in the United States and I'm, I'm I, I understand it um, on my insides you know very similar to another topic that is discussed in the work a lot is violence and how we we've become so articulate in the, in in developing this violent language particularly as americans um that's another thing that i feel deeply inside of me tied to how i was learned how to be a, a young man and into the man that i am today uh the things that i enjoyed as a child and still do to this day but with those paintings with bierstadt that there's the thing it's it's not the painting it's the things that are underneath the painting it's like the it's the wagon ruts that you can still see carved in the soil or the defaced um sand creek massacre road sign that has bullet holes in it or the um or in manzanar in all the nails that are um rusting in the sun you know as when they tore down all the barracks that looked like they did it so fast as if to make it seem like it never happened. Or, you know, when I've been to Trinity, to the Trinity test site a number of times, it's like, it's just the desert. But then when you think about what was developed there and what, like, what is the sort of ethos or the pathos underneath it, mm -hmm. that, and I think that that, you know, I think that there's like, in order to really, I think, understand american culture that you're we're constantly flickering between having to forget and having to remember and i think that you know like there's that the amnesia part where we have to sort of willing willingly forget in order for this sort of strange religious cult that we're a part of to make it work and and so i'm like it's it's there are parts of it that i find really beautiful and then underneath all that are these layers of just of bones and blood and 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 gold and and more bones and then some more blood and skin and matted hair you know it's like um yeah you know and so those paintings for me the the genesis you know from thomas moran um, going on the Hayden expedition in 1871 to, he was third, he was the third uh, choice um, to accompany William Henry Jackson to make images of this expedition of Yellowstone, which is a place that I deeply love, um, you know, or, uh, or Caspar David Friedrich, who was painting things primarily from an imagination, you know, or, um, or, uh, or Bierstadt, like Bierstadt, Thomas Cole, um, and and Thomas Moran and Caspar David Friedrich figure very strongly in this show, but they're not all from the same kind of movement of imagining landscape. Um, but the the manifest destiny thing, you know, is is like really, it's part like part of the creation myth that is like built into how we consume products to how we develop our um like where we live how we move our bodies around what we feel entitled to you know and thinking about um even when we go to the grocery store it's it's all built in there and i think that so much of my interest in making art is like trying to identify where those things are and then how I function in relationship to it. And oftentimes the picture that comes back is one where I'm woven into it 
that it's woven in me so deeply that I can't get away from it. And so I think that to a certain degree, making art is a way to like come to terms with that. You know, it's like, otherwise you're just like, you know, just stick a gun in your mouth and end it because it, it's all for naught, you know? And so, um, but yeah, I just rambled there, but no, sorry for no, it, it, it reminds me. And, you know, I think we're roughly the same age, but I, I remember when uh, the movie American Beauty came out, the, the, po- yeah. the, the subtext or uh, on the poster was, you know, look closer, right? Because it's like at the surface, everything was perfect, but the, the, you know, the more you kind of peeled away the perfection in this, um, you know, typical American family, the more just a, a hot mess it was. Right. And, and so like in your, your exhibit, you know, yeah, there is the, the absolute, uh, ideal beauty, but then there are these other pieces that are very dystopian and, in and, and in those pieces, there, there's even uh, spots where it looks like a mountain is is sort of dilapidated, and we're we're seeing an exposed, you know, scaffolding of almost like it was um, a deteriorating movie set, right? It's almost like was it all real in the first place, or was it all just an illusion? Yeah, I, I assume that's part of the the dialogue you're wanting us to have there, right? Yeah, I think that it's you know, I think that. I, I see relationships between how Thomas Cole would bemoan the American landscape because it lacked um, art history, you know, like a, a history or mythology or an architecture that he could identify as being important to frame the experience of landscape or um, to Disney Imagineers and engineers um, creating the Matterhorn in Anaheim. And that's what that's in direct reference to, or, Imagineers recreating uh, Mount Everest to put a roller coaster in it. And <laughs> I think that there's, um, you know, for me, you know, that those things really um, ex- like those are expressive of how we think about our natural environment, which I believe has always been extraterrestrial or that we're the extraterrestrials and that is that this place isn't like really our natural home because we don't actually treat it that way. And so you know, I think there's, um, yeah, there, the, for me, you know, I, I, I think of Thomas Cole and, and, um, the Hudson river school painters, um, or if you, even if you've been to Frederick church's home, you know, he recreated the whole, and you know, the entire landscape around the house to, to make it an ideal sort of natural place. But I think about these things in direct relationship to, you know, fantasy art, or in relationship to the Dungeons and Dragons monster manual, or or to artists' um, imaginations of extraterrestrial beings living in atmospheres that don't reflect our own. Like, what does life look like in other places? And I think that that, for me, you know, thinking of Thomas Moran and Albert Bierstadt and um, Thomas, you know, like all of them being as um, you know fantasy artists. Um, and that's like a thing that I really was am hoping. Well, that's what I'm trying to express in the work. Um, you know, Earth only has one moon, but all of those, um, all of the paintings that are in this show have multiple moons. Um, I, I felt like when I heard you talk about your exhibit, you several times you've referred to experiencing Earth from the perspective of an alien, right? <laughs> It made me think how they're subtly different and not exactly real. It's it's almost as if an alien is trying to uh, reminisce about or you know create postcards of his experience on Earth, right? And it's it's a little off, just like the hotel room at the end of two thousand one, a space odyssey. They've they've re- tried to recreate a space comfortable for this human visitor, but it's, it's a little off, right. In in terms of it's mildly fantastic in a way that's different than, than our human experience. Am I, am I touching on something that's in the work or am I, is that just me? Oh, for sure. For sure. But I, I think that I'm not, I, I mean, it's us. We're, we're not, you know, that, you know, um, one of my favorite art, cause you know, like I studied printmaking early on. So my favorites, you know, were Katikowicz and Odilon Redon and Goya. 
And, you know, the Goya's in Goya's disasters of war, you know, that there is like cave you know, with the woman um, fighting, you know, lighting a cannon or, um, you know, or like, uh, you know, and, and this too, and babies, or the famous one is, I think it's Grande Hasana con Muertos. Um, the, and, you know, I think about these works as, you know, that, and here in this place, we also were here and did this as well. And so in the painting where there's Goya's trees denuded of their ornament, I think it's called denuded of ornament. I think that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I called the artwork. Um, and you know, it, it's like, I think of that, I think of these things as being hypothetically a place just like earth and that we've also been to, and that we also made theme parks in and that we also just murdered the shit out of each other and poisoned all the rivers and you know, cut all the trees down and did all that. And it continued on and it turned into its own thing, but we're absent from it. And I think that that's like probably the stupidest way I could talk about the artwork, but I do think of, I don't think of it out as othered. Like there's no other thing that I'm trying to be <clears throat> or pointing finger towards. It's all about me, my relationship, our relationship, a part of this uh, community, um, uh, city, society, earth that I'm a part of now all of us doing it. And, um, and so it's like, I never want, I never want it to be outside of that. I always want it to point back to me, never to someone else. So how do you categorize these pieces? I mean, they're, they're two dimensional, mostly on the wall. There's some relief, yeah. you know, what do you call them paintings or? Yeah. Do, I mean, I think, yeah, for sure. I think that there's very much an illusory game and, and this, for this show, um, these, this is the most amount of paint I've ever used on a painting or I think this is the only, one of the only times I've ever used paint on a painting. And, and I think the, even when I'm using different materials, like what I'm creating is, is an illusion. And I think that that for me, it's it, paint isn't about the material, but rather like, what are you trying to achieve? Um, you know, in this window. And, and so they're rectangles, they're framed, <laughs> you know, they're, they're hung at, these ones are hung at 58 on center. They're very conservative in a lot of ways, but um, in terms of the dimensionality of the work, you know, that early on, like, I, I think that some of my favorite painters early on were um, one of my teachers named Denzel Hurley. Um, he currently has a show now at Canada Gallery. Um, he was a wonderful instructor. Um, he's no longer with us, unfortunately, but, um, and he led me to Ad Reinhardt and Ad Reinhardt made these paintings that were, you know, were, were magical because that you couldn't really tell how they were made there were, and that there was an illusory thing that was happening in the work that, that, that got you wrapped up in the conventions of how the thing is made and, and the conventions of itself going back to what he was trying to achieve in making non-objective painting. And I think that in that regard, that that's stuck around till now. And so like in this work, what you're looking at are, are basically a three-dimensional space, like a real space, like they're, they're a bas relief of an image. Like they're not just happenstance. They're selected to make, to create this, to deepen that illusory um, experience. But the textures and the surfaces that describe that space, the three-dimensional surfaces are totally separate from the images that are being painted on top of it. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create a work that both um, welcomes one's um, entry into it, like to enter into that space with our imagination, but at the same time, creating a real space that is fundamentally um, disjunctive, that doesn't allow that entrance. And so for it to flicker in this, in this space where hopefully you're confronted with how it's made, which is puzzling. And then like, as you step back from it, that it, that it functions in relationship to our actual, actual experiences of outside and our um, memory of art history and our memory of actual places 
but never really allows us in so that these can be um, works that are are imagining somewhere else, some other place far away, while simultaneously being present and here. And familiar. And familiar, yeah. I really, I'm very, very uh, doggedly, um, you know, aggressive in the reference. I, I don't ever want to hide what the thing is in reference to. I really want people to um, be able to uh, take, you know, images or a Google search or, or whatever to, to, to help them um, and like experience the work uh, deeper. I, I want to be as generous as possible all the time with the work and how I make it, which doesn't mean that I want to hold everybody's hand and going through it, but I want um, there to be um, so much information so that people can have a, have an experience that gets as close to mine as, as possible. So we can share that, you know, because that's like the only thing that I have now. I mean, I think that one of the best things, the most exciting thing about having an art exhibit is that you get to experience the work and you get to experience how people respond to it. And that in the moments where people are sharing some of the same ideas and feelings, you're like, ha, I exist. And this is important. <laughs> this is, and this is, there's something here that's real. Um, and that part you get to keep. So can we take an inventory of exactly what all processes are at play? Yeah. I, where, where, where would you start? Where did they start? You know, Bierstadt has been in there for at least 15 years, 16 years. And, um, and so it starts with an image that I'm drawn to that has that strangeness to it that I'm still honestly trying to like understand. And, and like, why is this thing keep having me think about it? I'm not thinking about it because I'm getting paid. I'm not thinking about it. It's just there. And that image, uh, it gets turned into like a sort of composite Photoshop, kind of a dummy. It's like, I'm not mm -hmm. good in Photoshop, but I'm good enough to make an image. I'm like, oh yeah, like a sky like that. And, ooh, like what if I was able to get the sky from the background of uh, Yuki Ona in the movie Quiet On, you know, that's like a big eye in the sky. Oh, but that would also look great with that, the rainbowy sudsy foam on my car window. And oh, I love that because the car window, like that's how you experience America. And like, so it, it has these things that are like built into it. And that gets turned into a composite image, you know, collage. And then I take that image into uh, like a 3D file, a 3D, 3D program called Rhino. And it's, you know, way sophisticated program that I use. It's kind of like, you know, having like, um, like a slug driving a Ferrari. But, um, but so I make a vector drawing um, that just, and, and I try to describe the space not based upon its stuff, but rather how can I imagine um, this space in 11 to nine uh, eighth inch layers because, and that's all the totally subjective, right? Where it's mm -hmm. like the scale of the painting is the scale of the painting because I feel like that these are the scale that has a relationship to my body that I feel um, it doesn't feel miniature. It doesn't feel, it feels getting close to like a window looking outside to a real place. And then the other side too, is that it all has to fit within two inches of a frame. Mm -hmm. And so they're really, you know, like the controls are all there in that way. Um, and then, so make a drawing and then the thing gets cut up and turned into 11 layers. So it's like a three-dimensional exploded um, puzzle. That's all glued together, vacuum bagged. And then, and on top of that is just like layers of texture that are made out of, you know, sawdust and floor sweepings and uh, paper mache. And I mean, it's like really kindergarten, like, like giant scale kindergarten art. 
And that goes back to like, even my earliest show, like the first show that I had in New York, I really wanted to make a show that was using technique and material in the way that I learned how to make art. Cause I never learned how to make a painting. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so the, the textures are like busted apart plywood and stuff on the floor and all that. And that creates the, the, the topography. And then on top of that, um, I have a laser in the studio and I'll put the piece on the laser and then I'll etch into its surface, like the beginnings of the digital information that I use to create the painting after it's etched. Um, you kind of see it. It's like a thing that you do that you can't see, but it's really important in the end. Cause I've seen the difference. Mm -hmm. Um, and then after that it's painted white and after it's painted white, I then, um, I invented, I'm using that term very loosely invented <laughs> a, a, re, a reductive, um, a reductive four color painting process where I'm laying down colors of paint, CMYK. Uh -huh. And then between, you know, after I've put the color down, um, I etch away everything that's not that color. So what I'm leaving behind, what I'm leaving behind are all, um, you, you know, just the four colors, like yellow, blue, magenta, yellow, blue, red, black, right? And and because of my knowledge in printmaking, it, it and it's made it so that I can figure that out. But also at the same time, it goes back to late 19th century when people were, you know, trying everything under the sun to um, um, to economically and rapidly reproduce photographic imagery to be consumed in mass. And for all those reasons, it's like the late that late period of the 19th century is like all these different modes of photographic printing were being developed. Um, this is also like the genesis for the work, you know, from the Hayden expedition in 1871. It's also ties to um, Rebecca Solnit's River of Shadows and to Edvard Muybridge. And that book was really, really fundamental for me. Um, and then also, um, you know, and, and creating a process where the materials, everything is where I want it to be, but I don't know what's going to come out the other side because the process that I developed is such that if the layers of paint are just a little bit off, the color spectrum is totally whack. So it, and, and I, I embrace that because if I'm going to describe a tree, but my tree is only, it comes out orange and purple, then it doesn't really look like a tree here. Maybe it looks like a tree somewhere else. And so to have that like extra terrestrial, some other place being described very purposefully, but at the same time, not really having control over how it's being described is like really satisfying. Um, unfortunately, in the time since I've become uh, really good at the process. So now I'm able to recreate the colors that I'm creating in Photoshop. Some of the earlier work in the show, if I showed you the composite image, it's like not it's not the same. And I think that for me, that part is so exciting because to go down that road and to put all the plate, to put all the pieces exactly where they belong. And then to go through this whole process to then find yourself describing something that you don't, that, that doesn't look like the thing that you thought you were trying to make is like where I've uh, stepped outside of myself. And it, and for me, that part is always like super exciting. Um, so, uh, and then the sky, the skies are all, um, made from cast material that I've made, uh, either lunar surface on the laser. And we made a mold of this large lunar surface thing. And then, um, and then the slur, this sort of spilly stuff in the sky is all from me making spills of wax and then making a mold of that. And there's a little bit of a funny kind of thing in that where it's like, the most expressive thing is also just like reproduced. It's like, it's not about the expressive part, but at the same time, what you're seeing is like the spilly thing, which is like paint expression, I guess. And, um, 
And then the trees are all taken from a mold of an actual tree and then painted in the mold. And um, the sky and the trees are all assembled afterwards. And then after all that's been done, um, the rivers are uh, filled with lead that ties to earlier work um, that, you know, is, and for me in these works, I think about how, when I was a kid, there was this um, national geographic publication called our universe and how it talked about um, planets in our galaxy as having, you know, environments unimaginably inhospitable to human life, you know, of it raining hydrochloric acid and rivers of copper or whatever. And I think that in these works in particular, the lead moves out of a sort of um, <clears throat> commentary on um, uh, violence and, um, and, uh, poison and toxicity and so on and so forth, but rather into an imaginary river of um, some other planet with a different environment of, of an environment that differs from our own. So, and that's, but that's generally how they're made. <laughs> and, yeah, and it's so simple, oh, right? See how crazy an artist is. And that's yeah. So like, yeah, that, that would have been great uh, with, for the person next to you at the dinner party to that, you know, at what point would they have just like, okay, I it, uh, just called a timeout. Right. <laughs> or you look over and they're just a skeleton. Right. Exactly. No, but you know, the, the, the rivers of lead, it, they reminded me, um, Back when I used to teach art history, there was uh, I'm I'm trying to remember there was there was there was a particular area, and I want to say it was like in in the Forbidden City in China. That there was like this inner sanctum yes. that yes. had you know it was like a mercury. pools of mercury that were like the they were like scaled down rivers in this. Uh, it was just like incredibly toxic, but you know. It's just captivating the thought that you have this mirrored like surface of this organic material that definitely matches what you're saying. You know, this this inhospitably beautiful, toxic body of water, right? And I think too, it's like, you know, that you can make ties to Richard Serra's, you know, mapping Jasper John's studio or uh, to Robert Smithson's asphalt pour. Um, you know, it, it's, or Linda Benglis, or, you know, you can think about a lot of different people, but for me, it, it, it's the, the, I think, yeah. Like when I learned about that too, I was just like, oh, I want to see that so bad. Right. Like in real, I want to see it in real life. Let, let me ask you. So a lot of these pieces have a visual effect in the color that feels rather iridescent. Was yep. that intentional or is that part of what you were talking about where the, the registration being a little bit off and is that a welcomed accident or is that part of the intention? My natural inclination is to try to perfect the process. I'm hardwired to do that. I think it comes from being raised by a lot of, by a lot of time card, you know, like manual labor and, and, and thinking about my value is directly connected to how good of a job I can do. Um, and so in those cases where it does become iridescent, it's where I'm so deep in this thing that I just described that I haven't gotten the correct amount of like material down. And so the way that it gets embedded in the layers of clear, um, it doesn't, it doesn't etch properly. Um, and, and it's, so it's, so it's, that's actually kind of a fuck up, but I think that, um, I welcome that because it's like, it's a part of the learning process and I don't like mistakes in art. I feel like, uh, for me, like if there's a mistake, it feels like, um, I failed. Um, but I'm trying to let it in more. You know, the mistake begins to look too much like expressionistic and the expressionistic I've, I've, I'm very, I don't trust it. And so, um, yeah, you've, you've pointed out a part that I'm one of the many failures that I see in the work. 
<laughs> well, it's you beautiful. Know, yeah, but yeah, I mean, that's the question though. It's like, you know, how I can see your perspective that as being a printmaker, I mean, so much of it is meticulousness about getting that process right. I imagine that's a bit of an inward struggle for you, like trying to let go and being accepting of accidents. Yeah. I mean, well, or the other thing too, is that, you know, invariably, you know, when we, when I would be printing for other people that when we would show them, show the artist samples of what, what we were, you know, thinking about what might be cool, the processes for them to work with, but they would, they would always like the ones that didn't quite work very well. And so we would, I would find, you know, a lot of, a lot of printers will tell the story, but you would find yourself in the additioning process, you know, of, of like kind of not printing the thing the way that it's actually supposed to be printed mm. so that you can achieve that thing throughout the edition. And so for me, you know, a lot of times there are mistakes and then I'm, and then for me, it's like, in like, Oh, I like that. And be like, how did I do that? Okay. I did it like this. I'll go back to step a and be like, okay, step H is where I took a little bit of a different turn. So that's the part of making the path to create this, what looks like an accident, but reliably. And, and I'm just, I'm just hard. I'm just wired to do that. Sure. I wish I was, I wish I could just be like, you know, I like, I, I wish I could just make watercolors or um, make a thing that is, but it's just not how I think. You know, when I'm looking at these, these pieces of art, you know, th especially with the way it's pieced together, at some point in the process of looking at your work, I start thinking about those Tiffany landscape windows at the Met, right? It's yeah, like, you know, these guys must have been going through a similar process of alchemy in terms of finding the right color mixture of glass and, you know, breaking it into exactly these right pieces. And then they bring in lead and it's like, it feels like there's, there's some kinship there. Oh, I, I love it. I mean, uh, there you, you've hit an, uh, you've hit a reference straight on the head Ed, that I am totally in love with. I, Lewis, Com Lewis comfort, Tiffany. I think that I've had a, an appreciation of stained glass. My parents made stained glass, my, um, and I've just been like my around a lot of craft and, the for me I, i'm like in love with you know the i'm in love with tiffany i'm i'm and if like if anybody's listening that works for tiffany uh <laughs> give me the keys please <laughs> um but no i love that and they're like the colors and the richness and i think that just the natural translucency of like that material and how i don't know yeah love it all and i think too goes back to that moment in time. And I think that, you know, going, going back to the late 19th century, you know, that for me, I feel like we're in this, we're in the exact same place where we're being asked really, really important questions by the technology that we've developed and our engagement with this place that we call home earth. And it, we are at this precipice of a reckoning of of our uh, past, our history, but also seeing so many opportunities for the future. Um, you know that that really it's it's a very very similar moment in time, and so, and for me, I, I'm I'm gravitating towards that period of time as well, where like the individual maker of the, the individual and their ability to make their environment um, from the clothes on their body to shoes on their feet to the home that they live in to so on and so forth was a, was a lot closer. And for me in making contemporary art, I, I think more and more I, I'm, I really want to go to a place of making something from my imagination that does not that falls outside of like, you know, that maybe is at once industrial, but at the same time, something that, that I can make that comes from me that doesn't, that isn't 
sort of trapped by my 21st century reality being surrounded by a, a material um, industrial um, reality that's so far out of my grasp. And I want to bring more of it into making what we call contemporary art to making something that hopefully is maybe um, more akin to something made um, before the industrial revolution. I can't articulate it perfectly, but I can see a path in how I'm going to be able to deepen that. It's hard to put words on because you're, you're an alchemist, right? You're, you're creating something of higher value from these pieces, trying to create two plus two equals five. Yeah. I mean, I, I think too, I think that early on from very early on my insistence, my insistence in using the scrap material or the things that were thrown away, you know, tied to Russian constructivism and, and it was political. It was also for me thinking about how, you know, that like, I come from a place where people weren't important and that their ideas weren't important. And, um, you know, and, and for me, I think that my education was not good and being treated not super good. A lot of the time, I think, I identified with thinking about the materials that I was using as giving them an opportunity to, to like shine for a moment, you know, and it's, mm -hmm. it's silly. It's a silly thing, but I think that you, you, you are correct. And, and I think, you know, um, with a lot of craft and with a lot of art, I mean, we're constantly seeing, you know, the, you know, these unbelievably beautiful things being made by beautiful people describing their experience here on earth that is um you know that does that exact thing that takes this thing that you could leave for nothing and to make you focus on it and to think about it and maybe consider its beauty um that for me that's always exciting yeah so are you taking some time off or are you the the restless type that makes every day um like it's funny i don't sketch i don't make like i just go to the thing you know, mm -hmm. to make the thing, because for me, that's like the gamble, that's the part, the, the risk of it. And, um, and so no, I like right now, it's like, I'm, I, I'm appreciating that there are people in the world that want to show my work. And I, and I want to meet that as best I can. And I think that there is like that, there's a little bit of a sort of youthful naivete that I want to maintain until i'm dead to think that there is like in having the opportunity to pass it by feels um not respectful of the fact that i'm never coming back here again hmm. so um no I, i'm we i'm working continuing on and the but i think i'm gonna ride my bike a lot <laughs> all right and so do you think you'll find inspiration on your bike is that where, right. where where do you find your inspirations? Is it is it looking back into into art history, or is it is it the world around you, or is it all of the above? No, uh, you know, like, uh, do you have kids? I do, I do. Yeah, Got a couple so, of like, teenagers. You know, yeah, so you know, like the sound of a Lego box. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like looking for that one particular piece, I, I I've never said this before. Um, and the reason why I do these things is because this is not rehearsed. And so the thing that comes out of me, I don't really know what I'm going to say to you. Right. Um, and so, but the thing is, you just helped me realize that no, like the art history is the Lego box, you know, and that the experience of being on earth and riding my bike and having a conversation with you or like seeing something strange on the side of the road. Like for instance, like there's a sculpture that I'm making now that's based on an experience where I saw uh, a truck fire where the canopy of the, where the cab of the truck caught fire is totally engulfed in flames. And the carrot, the trailer was full of uh, livestock oh, and the, the truck driver had gone into the trailer to try to get all the cattle out of the trailer because they were, they didn't want to get out. They were afraid. And, and he, and super dangerous to put your body in there. You Absolutely. Could get anyway, 
And so at that moment, I was like, oh, wait, that's what the door of the sculpture needs to be. Perfect. And so it's like the, the, the inspiration, it's never in the studio. Like I love making things. That's a totally different thing. That's not where the inspiration happens. That's where like problems are solved. Mm. And like, I go back into the Lego box and I'm like, <laughs> oh, wait, that's this found it. Perfect. Um, and two, I think that going back to Lego box is like, and, or in thinking about reference, you know, I think that as we double our photographic record of human experience every year, you know, as we've been doing for the last, what, 20 years or something like that, is that we, um, the, the, the images that persist and the images that we've left behind are, are maybe even more mysterious because the, the contemporary psychedelic is not a matter of making an image strange, but just saying it over and over and over and over again until it's strange. But it's not about making it weird you know, making it like trippy or something, but the images from the past that kind of still hang on museum walls and printed on t-shirts and whatever, those are the things that I still feel like need to be understood because that's in the, the aggregate in the foundation that we've built this kind of fucked up house on. So. And so it's not just these big rectangular pieces in the show. There are also other things that, you've worked on that are that are kind of outside that scope right well i mean i think that there i mean i think in the show the the thing that gives me a lot of pride is the fact that i've been able to com collaborate with some really brilliant people um one of whom is solange agazuri partridge who is my favorite jewelry designer and one of my favorite people and she just trusted me to make this ring based upon uh, Hoisman's Against Nature and an experience in that text. Um, it's a trade. So we there's it's not an artwork for sale, but rather it's a thing that fits my body, that focuses me as like a, a part of the thing that I'm being critical of in the exhibition. I'm present in the space. There's always something that goes back to my body or my likeness that kind of that it's that that puts me within that sort of idea space and the other is with jason wang of best scent from shanghai this is our third collaboration together where he developed a scent based on many many conversations and through his daughter who is studying chemistry and art and art history at um, smith college she was creating the formulas there based upon his um, based upon what he was working on in Shanghai to create the scent in the space, which was to be imagined, which is to, which was, um, he was to imagine himself as an alien to have fallen in love with earth and to have gone back home and to try to recreate an essence of his experience, but using all stuff that wasn't on earth. So to make something that's totally synthetic. And then the third collaborator um, who was a very, very dear friend and a very deep collaborator and a very deep inspiration for me was my friend David Tompkins, um, who passed away in Marfa, Texas in, in 21. And the work that we made was a collaboration, was originally shown with a um, with Neville Wakefield at PS1 in a show called 1969. Mm -hmm. um, footprint in the show is was a product of that collaboration. And because it's Buzz Aldrin's footprint in Trinitite and sand on earth and colliding, you know, NASA and the military industrial complex, earth and the moon simultaneously into one object image was a way that I wanted people to start the exhibition. But for me, I wouldn't have gotten to this place without, um, without David and his, brilliance and his generosity it's always makes me sad but but to have him in the show is important to me and so um those collaborators are are huge in in making this exhibition happen well matthew i have really enjoyed this hour you know just you know kind of winding you up and getting you to talk about your work because there's you know there's so much there and I really appreciate your time and I really encourage people to head out to Pace or check it out online. I'll put some links up, but uh, the show's up through July 1st. It's Against Nature. Man, thanks for your time. 
Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate it. That's all the time we have for this week. You've been listening to ArtSense. You can find the show on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe. And while you're there, please rate the show and leave a quick review. Your feedback is the key to other folks finding us. And if you'd like to see images related to the conversation, read the transcript, and find other bonus features, you can go to cambia.art and click on the podcast tab. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can email me at craig at cambia.art. Thanks for listening.